Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the 3D Software Rendering Tutorial Series. Last time, we got triangular meshes being drawn, which is great. The problem is it only works for completely convex objects, like this sphere, or a cube, or a cylinder, or a pyramid, or anything like that, any convex object. If we try something a little more advanced, like, say, Blender's monkey head, then, well, it doesn't quite work right. Some of the triangles are being drawn in the wrong order, pixels are overwriting each other, and it's just not a very nice situation. So what do we do? How do we cope with this sort of scenario? And the answer is something that's either called depth buffering or Z buffering. And the idea is, at every pixel in the image, we store how far that pixel is from the camera in 3D space. If a pixel that we're trying to draw is closer than the pixel that's already drawn, well, we draw it. If it's far farther than the pixel we're trying to draw, then it's behind, so we don't draw it because then it would overwrite. So it's a very simple and straightforward technique, and it will make these issues work out a lot nicer. So let's go ahead and let's implement that. So, the first thing we're going to need to do is interpolate depth across the face of the triangle. And this requires modifying the Edge and Gradients class, and I did it off-screen, because it's the same process we do every time we add a new interpolant. We create a variable for it, so we have depth and the depth step, we have a getter for the depth, we initialize it based on the gradients, and in the step function we add depth step to depth. So that's what we do in Edge. In gradients, we create a new array for the depth that stores the depth at each vertex in a triangle. We have a getter for the depth, we have a getter for the depth x and y steps, We and yeah, we initialize the depth array, we have certain values, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And we calculate the depth step, the depth step, from the depth array. And there we go. So, what do we initialize the depth to? It seems sort of intuitive, but we're initializing it to the z value. But as I mentioned earlier, we actually have two z values. We have the z value we're using for depth in the z component, and the z value we're storing in w, which is used for, well, Things like perspective correctness. Well, how do we how do we adjust perspective? That's the depth in the W component. So, and like I said, these are distinct because they might not be the same. If you're drawing an object with an orthographic projection which has no perspective, that doesn't necessarily mean you want all depth checking to just flat out fail. <laughs> you know, you're probably still going to want things to be drawn correctly with depth. So this is why we go through the pain of separating them. So this, this depth value will work for occlusion, this depth value works for perspective. So, with that, we now really have all we need to do to do z-buffering. It's a pretty straightforward technique, so let's go ahead and let's implement it. Now, the first thing we want to do is just create the depth buffer itself. This is going to be private float, float array, excuse me, I'm going to call mzbuffer. Like I said, the term z-buffer and depth buffer pretty much interchangeable. So, yeah. And in the constructor, we're going to initialize this. Now, how big do we want this to be? Well, we want one depth value for every pixel on screen. So I'm going to make this size width times height. And there we go. That's our depth buffer created. Simple as that. So now, let's use those depth values. We're going to have to do some of the same stuff we do for all interpolants first off, so let's duplicate these lines for our step and value. So our, so for our depth x step, we're going to recalculate, well, the depth step, based the same thing we had in gray. So this will be right.getDepth minus left.getDepth, divided by x distance. And the reason we're doing this is, again, floating point precision. If we just use a value in the gradients, then sometimes if we draw a really skinny triangle, then this can 
end up being too, a little bit too big, and it causes a step outside the triangle, cause array out of bounds issues, and it's a mess. So just recalculate it for numerical st stability. And for the depth, pretty s simple. We're going to say left dot get depth, and we're going to add the depth x step times the x pre step. And again, this whole pre step in business is to take into account the distance we move when we convert from floating point values to integers. So, yeah, this just steps us based on however much distance that is. And with that, we can go ahead and actually, well, do the depth test. So I'm going to start out by creating an integer, and I'm going to call index, because I cannot think of a better name right now. This is going to be i time, oh, sorry, i plus j times get width. So, yeah, there we go. This is the index in the depth buffer we're going to use x location plus our y location times the width. Now, the way we're going to use this, of course, is just mz buffer sub index, but how do we do the test? Well, it's a simple if check. We're going to say if this, you could say if this is greater than depth, I believe, and this will work, but I think it's a little bit more intuitive to do it the other way around. If our current pixel's depth is less than, if this is closer than the depth of the pixel that's already in the z-buffer, only then do we actually want to draw and, in fact, update the z-buffer. So here we'll say z-buffer sub index becomes depth. Otherwise, we just keep stepping as normal, which reminds me, in here we want to use depth plus equals depth x step. And there. So, if our depth is less than the depth of old pixel, then we update the z-buffer and draw the pixel. Otherwise, we just keep going. And that's, it's that simple. That's the depth test. There's only one more subtlety to this. It's not a hard technique, but there is one subtle thing we have to deal with. And that is, we have to clear the z-buffer every frame. Because otherwise, well, we're comparing depth values from the pixels in the last frame, and then that causes some problems. So public void clear depth buffer. And this is just going to go do 4i equals 0, i is less than z buffer dot length. I'm going to go through the entire thing, and every time, in every pixel, we're just going to say pixel sub i, not 0, be careful about that. We're going to say the pixel at the current index equals float dot max value. So this is the highest floating point value, this might vary depending on what language you're using. But yeah, that's, that's how this works. And the reason we're doing that is because this will always pass. Whatever depth value we have will always be less than the floating point max value. That said, our depth value really shouldn't be more than, well, 1 or so. So you can really just say this equals 10 if you want. But, you know, this is more accurate, I believe. So anyways, for me, every time through the loop, we're going to target.clear, target.clear depth buffer. And this really should be all we need to do. So let's build and run. And what do you know? Here it is. Here is the monkey head being drawn and working just fine. And just for fun, we can go ahead and use a higher polygon version of it. So this one has, I believe, 15,000 triangles in it. And why not? We can go ahead and use a little bit of a different rotation. Doesn't particularly matter. But here you go. We have... Well, I don't like the fact that you can't see the face like that. Okay, I'll use the old rotation. <laughs> I'm just playing around at this point, in case you can't tell, but yeah. We have z-buffering working. It's working, it's properly determining the occlusion order, and we can use it to draw arbitrary meshes now. We can draw arbitrary meshes and arbitrary orders, whatever positions, and whatever we want. And that is awesome. But... Right now, we're still confined. Although we can draw arbitrary meshes, they still must be entirely on screen and entirely within the depth range. If they're outside the screen, even a little bit, our program crashes. So how can we handle this? How can we make sure, well, everything stays within the screen? Find out next time on the 3D Software Rendering Tutorial Series. Hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and I'll see you next time.